Hello to my friends joining us via recording. We are starting our work on lab lesson number two, which is about microscopy, regional terms, and cells. So we're going to start our class by playing with a virtual microscope. You can see the, um, the address for this virtual microscope on your screen. I'm going to pull up that website. Uh, I will also post the address to this microscope in the YouTube description. So a couple of different ways to get it. For my friends here in class today, let me pull up my microscope. Ooh, I hope it's working. Tell me in the chat, uh, have we gotten, oh, there we go. How many of us have the microscope working on our computer? Give me a thumbs up. Working for Carissa. Nice, got the split screen going on. Perfect, okay. Lots of us have it going. Hopefully mine will, mine will probably get angry at me again, like it did with Visible Body. <laughs> Why are you doing so many things? Okay, so here we are in the virtual lab. My virtual lab's a little bit cooler, but at least in this one, we can play with the microscope. So what we want to do here at the beginning, yeah, it's going, it's really going really slow on my end too. Uh, what we want to do here at the beginning is we're going to go ahead and click the learn button. We're going to learn about how to use the micro. Ooh, we're going slow. I guess I have to say to my computer that I feel you. Okay, so it's very similar to the microscope that you see in your lab packet. Um, so as we go through and we click on some of these different parts, it's going to tell you their names. You can work on labeling them and thinking about what those parts do. So the first part up here uh, that I'm going to click on these are called the, they call it the eyepiece here. We're going to call it the oculars. Um, so on your worksheet, these are called the ocular lenses. The ocular lenses are the part of the microscope that you initially look through. So if we were in a lab, this is what we would be using to look down at our specimens. It mentions in their notes here that the oculars can have different uh, magnifications. For the sake of our class, always assume that an ocular has a magnification of 10 times. So our microscopes have oculars that magnify things 10 times, which means if we didn't make them any bigger, if we didn't use any of our other objectives, we would be making things 10 times bigger just by using these little oculars. When we look at things though, um, we don't just magnify them once. It's not just the oculars that make things bigger. The other thing that makes things bigger are our objectives. So hanging down underneath those oculars, there's a set of three structures. So you can see one, two, and three. These are called the objective lenses. When you're looking in our lab packet, you can see that the objective lenses have three different sizes. Those three different sizes correlate with how much they can magnify things. So the, the smallest one, in this picture I see it, it pointing out over here, on, on our microscopes, this one has a red stripe on it. The red objective is called the scanning objective. The scanning objective by itself makes things four times bigger. The next size objective that's hidden with my check mark here is called the low power objective. And the low power objective, like the notes say down here, gonna make things 10 times bigger. So the low power objective makes things 10 times bigger. The scanning objective makes things four times bigger. If we wanna break out the big guns and really make things bigger, we're gonna use our last one on our microscopes called the high power lens. And the high power lens in our lab has a blue stripe on it. 
the the blue stripe is uh, it makes things 40 times bigger. So I know they have things labeled a little bit differently down here in the description. Instead of calling this one mid power, we're going to call it high power. So summary of our objectives. The smallest one is the scanning objective. The middle sized one is the low power objective. And the longest one is the high power objective. When you're using a microscope, and we'll do a little bit of playing with them, uh, when we're using the microscope, you can actually rotate which objective is in place. So this blue structure they've highlighted here, where all of the objectives are attached, this is called the revolving nose piece. And the revolving nose piece allows the objectives to move around. Here's a, a big picture idea for you to keep in mind with microscopes. I know we're not using them together in person uh, since we're not in person right now, but every time you use a microscope in real life, you always have to start with the scanning objective in place. The littlest objective, the little one that sticks out on the side over here, that's the one we always start with to help us find what we're looking for. Once we have found what we're looking for, we can use this revolving nose piece that it's attached to, to rotate the low power objective into place. When that objective is in place, that's going to allow us to see things bigger. We'll focus it again, and then we'll rotate again to put the high power objective in place. So the revolving nose piece allows us to go between each of our objectives to help us uh, see things at different magnifications. The next thing we're going to look at is what you would use to help you focus on what we're looking at. So down here on the side of the microscope, there's a, a couple of question marks here. Let's start with our, our structure that's right next to the, this is called the arm of the microscope that goes up and down. The knob that's big, that's right next to the arm of the microscope is called the coarse adjustment knob. And if we were in person, I would have you turn this knob and you would watch as the place where your slides are attached, called the mechanical stage, you would see this go up and down a whole bunch. The course adjustment knob moves things a lot. We use it to, to generally get our specimen in focus, but then right next to it, sticking out farther, and you can see this in your lab packet, is the thing called the fine adjustment knob. And the fine adjustment knob is what we use to get things all the way focused. If we don't get things all the way focused on each of our objectives, when we turn that revolving nose piece, it's going to be really hard for us to see things clearly. So the fine adjustment knob is what you would use after you kind of focus something to make it even more in focus so that you can see things very clearly. Speaking of what moves up and down, I'm going to go over to my little click, my little question mark here. This whole area highlighted in blue is called the mechanical stage. And the mechanical stage is where you put a slide. This is the thing that goes up and down to help us focus our slide. And sometimes it's not even that we need to go up and down as much as we need to move our slide to the left or to the right. This structure uh, that I, oh, so they don't have it labeled, I guess. See this metal structure here? It's, it's not the diaphragm. I apologize. I thought it was. This structure right here uh, is called uh, the slide clip. This is used to clip our slide in place so that when you're trying to go left or right, this whole little metal thing would move to move your slide with it. Let's talk about this diaphragm that they, they have labeled. So in your lab packet, it's called the iris diaphragm. The iris diaphragm opens and closes to change the amount of light that's coming onto your slide. So the iris diaphragm is actually found underneath the stage, 
when you're looking at the picture of, uh, of our microscope head on, so right at the very front, you'll see it just underneath the stage, the iris diaphragm. Let me see what else they've labeled here. Okay, um, so this is another structure that we do have labeled in our packet as well called the stage adjustment knob. This is another way, this, this is what's actually going to control your clip here on the stage. Those levers that hang down to the bottom are the stage adjustment knobs to move the slide left and right, forward and backwards. The stage adjustment knob underneath the stage down here. This bottom part down below is called the base of a microscope. If we were in person, the, the base of the microscope is where you would put your hand under to support it as you're walking. We also have our top part up here where the ocular is attached to and where it extends down. Well, I guess they don't have it labeled that. Uh, we're going to call that the arm. So the, the arm and the base of the microscope are, are what we use to transport the microscope. Let me see what they got this one labeled. I'm thinking on off switch and that's not going to be helpful. Yep. <laughs> we don't have an on off switch up there on our microscopes. It's down a little bit lower. So ignore that one. Let me see what they call this one. There's what they got labeled the arm. Yep. So the arm of the microscope and the base of the microscope, the two things that we use to transport the microscope. When you look at any microscope, including or any of our microscopes, so this virtual one and our real one, we talked about how we have the ocular lenses that magnify things 10 times by themselves. And then down below, we have those objective lenses that also magnify things at different levels. We're working with a type of microscope and, and the type that we see in here is what we call a compound microscope. Let's see if my computer will let me chat. A compound microscope, meaning that we magnify things twice to make them much bigger. So the objective lens that you have in place and the ocular lens that you're using, both of those things make, make what we're looking at bigger. Before I move on, do we have any questions about the parts we talked about or any other parts? Or shoot me a thumbs up if we're, we're feeling okay. Edith says no questions. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Well, let's go back and we will play with the microscope a little bit. We're going to practice how using a microscope would work. I'm not sure if you all can hear my computer whirring in the background. It is uh, working so hard. <laughs> To, to make this run. All right, let's do the explore option. Now we're back in the virtual lab. We're going to explore. If we were in person today, we would be looking at a slide that has um, three different colored fibers on it. And I, I think we're going to check out our slide box over here. I think they might have a slide like that. Um, if not, we're going to we're going to try together. So let's check out our sample slides. Oh, they must not have it. OK, well, here, let, well, let's go ahead and do the letter E together. We'll do the letter E since they don't have my my cross cross fibers here.
Now here's what I will mention with this virtual microscope. It, notice how it defaults for you to the four times objective lens. This is the, uh, the lowest, this is the red lens. We call it the scanning objective. Every time you look at a slide, you always have to start with the scanning objective and we have to get it, get it focused for us to be able to focus it anywhere else. So notice down here at the bottom, underneath my E, I have the coarse focus and I have the fine focus. This is representing those two knobs that we had. Remember that the coarse focus is the one that moves the stage a whole bunch. This is what you start with when you first put a slide on and it's completely out of focus. So I'm gonna play with my little coarse knob down here and I'm gonna move it until I feel like that E is, is close to in focus. We're, we're pretty good here. When I'm close to in focus, then I can go over here to my fine focus knob and turn that one a little bit as well to get my E all the way in focus. So notice that I used both of my adjustment knobs to make this E as clear as possible. Now that this E is as clear as possible, I'm going to go up to my next objective, the 10 times objective. Now here is um, a, a term that you'll see in the lab packet that relates to our microscopes for us to know. Our microscopes are what we call parfocal microscopes. Let me see if it'll let me type that in the chat for you. Parfocal microscopes. That means if I get something in focus with the scanning objective, when I go up to the low power objective, it should still be in focus. And notice on my slide that we stayed in focus here. I think, yeah, it'll let you, if you click on the picture, it'll let you move around a little bit. So I can see that this image stayed in focus because I focused it before. And with a parfocal microscope, I can go all the way up to 40 times to my high power objective lens. And when I'm up here with my high power objective lens, as long as I focused it well on the previous objectives, I'm not going to have to work anymore to get this image clear. See how it's still clear? Now, in real life, it probably doesn't work quite this well. You usually have to do a little bit of adjustment when you go from one slide to another. Here's an underlined highlight star idea, an important idea for you to think about as you're working on, on this assignment and on this lab packet. Once I start using the low power objective lens, my, my 10 times magnifier, or the high power objective lens, when I start using either of those lenses, I can only use the fine adjustment knob to make things get in focus. Let's say it another way. The only way or the only time you can use the coarse adjustment knob to bring things into focus is when you're using the scanning objective. Anything with more magnification power, we cannot use the coarse adjustment knob. We can only use the fine adjustment knob. So if this, this image was out of focus when I'm up here with my high power objective in place, the only adjustment knob I could use is that fine focus or that fine adjustment knob. Gonna back back up here to mention one other thing for us. Our compound microscopes magnify things twice, meaning they first magnify them with that part of the microscope up here called the ocular lens. And then second, they also magnify things down here with the objective lenses. What that means, the way that I can magnify things twice is by using mirrors inside the microscope itself. 
how we can tell that we're using mirrors inside this microscope is the fact that this letter E slide is upside down. See, when you put this slide on your microscope, it would be facing the correct way. You're, you're looking at your slide and there would be an E that you would read just like normal. But when you look at it inside your microscope, it's actually upside down because we took that image that you're seeing on the slide and we used a mirror to flip it and to make it bigger. So the, the point of looking at the letter E is for you to see that anything you're looking at in your microscope is actually upside down compared to what you would see on the stage itself, compared to if you looked at the, the slide by itself. Let's go ahead and take off the letter E. We're gonna remove that slide, and then I think we'll look at one more slide together. And this time, uh, I would actually recommend pick some random human slide that you would like to look at. So let me see which one I'm going to pick. We're going to go into human slides now. Hey, coming soon um, in two weeks, we're really going to start looking at, at tissues. So you will get very familiar with using this and using other ways to look at tissues. Let's look at one that we actually already talked about in lecture. Adipose tissue. What's the easy or normal person name for adipose tissue? What might a normal person call adipose? Yeah, absolutely. We read a whole article about adipose tissue, right? That's when we read the article about brown fat and white fat. Both of those were, were types of adipose tissue. So we're gonna look at, as opposed to our little sketches that, that we had in the homework assignment and in our notes, let's look at what actual adipose tissue looks like. All right, so I got my slide on here. I'm not seeing much of anything because I'm not in focus yet. I need to work to get this in focus. Notice that I'm over here with my scanning objective in place. That's where I always start. Since I'm using my scanning objective, I can use that course adjustment knob to see things more clearly. So I'm gonna start with my course adjustment knob Notice as I move that course adjustment knob, I'm starting to see things a little bit more clearly. But I look at this slide and I think, man, that looks really dark to me. I want to make that a little bit more visible. I'm going to come over here and work with my light. Now, as you slide the, the light lever, what this is equivalent to is uh, on, on what you're labeling. We have what's called the iris diaphragm lever. That's a lever that controls the amount of light that gets from underneath the microscope onto the slide. So I'm sliding my iris diaphragm lever. I want, oop, not that much light. <laughs> I want more light on my tissues to help me find it. I'm not quite in focus anymore. I'm gonna do a little bit more course adjusting and then I'm going to flip over to my fine adjustment knob to try to see things a little bit more clearly now. So let's use that fine adjustment knob. Okay, I know it's really hard to see. I don't know if it's an issue with my, my computer or my lighting. How are we doing at home? Is it a little bit more clear at home? The adipose slide just might be really hard to see too. Yeah, it's difficult to see. 
This is maybe a little bit better. It's a little dark, but a little bit better. Okay, so I've got my I've got my adipose here, and I I'm good on the scanning objective. Now, because my microscope is a par focal microscope, I'm gonna bump up to ten times. Now I am using my low power objective. If I had not worked so hard to focus on the scanning objective, I would not be able to get this tissue focused on my low power objective. So the fact that it's in focus now is because I worked so hard to focus it before. Again, that's because my microscope is a par focal microscope. So here I am up at low power. Hey, check this out. I am looking at several adipocytes, adipose cells. Inside this cell, I've got one big lipid droplet. That's why it looks empty. There's one big thing of fat inside here. Which kind of adipose tissue are we looking at? Are we looking at white fat? or brown fat with one big lipid droplet. Yeah, several of us are chiming in in the chat. Absolutely, this is what white adipose tissue looks like. This is what your normal fat cells in the body look like. And in lab, when we start, in, in our lab class here, when we start looking at tissues in a couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at a whole lot of white fat where there's a big lipid droplet that takes up the entire inside of the cell. So this is my uh, my white lipid or my white adipocytes. For kicks and giggles, we'll bounce all the way up to high power. See if my computer has enough power, computing power to get there. Notice how I'm slightly out of focus here. To see this more clearly, I better not touch that course focus knob. That course adjustment knob would completely mess me up. I wouldn't be able to see. The only thing I can really play with is my fine focus knob. I'm not even optimistic this is going to help. Let's see. A little bit, maybe. I'm going to add a little more light. I just want to point out at this really high power, notice how we're looking completely empty in the middle. Because again, this cell is completely filled with, with this lipid droplet. We've got some spaces on the outside that look a little bit dark. Those are going to be the places where things like the nucleus or things like the ribosomes, some of those organelles that we're learning this week, where we would find them in a white fat cell. They get completely pushed to the outside because the entire middle is filled with adipose tissue. So when you look at a white fat cell, it looks empty because all of its organelles are pushed to the side. We don't need them. Yeah, so Audrey's pointing something out that I was actually gonna, gonna point out with you all as well too. I'm going to play with my adjustment knobs really fast. I want you all to keep your eye over here on the stage. So I want you all to watch the stage here as I start to play with. First, I'm going to play with my quartz adjustment knob. Watch my stage. Notice how it moved down dramatically. You can see it. I can bring it back up. Look at how much it moves with that quartz adjustment knob. When I use the fine adjustment knob, the stage does still move, but not nearly as much. And this is true in real life as well, that when you turn that fine adjustment knob, the stage, it actually, in real life, you kind of even can't see it move that much. 
Um, but the course adjustment knob, we can absolutely see it. So the fine focus or the fine adjustment knob doesn't move the stage very much. The course adjustment knob moves it all over the place. You're totally right, Audrey. I just broke lab rule, uh, lab microscope rule like number one, which is to not use that course adjustment knob when I'm at 40 times. If we were in the actual lab and I went nuts with my course adjustment knob like that, what actually might happen is my slide that you can kind of see here on, on my stage, it might actually bump into my objective lens and it could actually break it. So we never use the course adjustment knob with my high power or my low power objectives because they're, they're too close to the stage and we could literally break a slide by using that course adjustment knob. So if I was showing you the right way to use microscopes, the only one I would use with my high power objective in place is this fine focus knob. Absolutely. Before I close out this and we go back to some of the pictures from the lab packet, are there any questions about what you saw in here with this virtual microscope? Okay, um, Audrey, you had a question from earlier. Yeah, so I'm gonna actually use our the picture from our lab packet to talk about the difference between the iris diaphragm and the condenser. So hold that thought, I'll show you those structures and we'll compare them with our, our in-class pictures. All right. Well, I suspect my computer is gonna be way happier if I switch over to using some of those lab packet pictures. So let me change what I'm sharing with you and we'll keep talking a little bit more about microscopes. All right, are we all seeing our picture from the lab packet? Perfect, okay. And hopefully my, my computer's starting to whir a little bit less, so it's getting a little bit easier <laughs> for my computer to function. Okay, um, so let me point out a few of the things that we talked about before. Um, I think most of the stuff on here we, we already hit on. So up here at the top, this is the part that you look through on the microscope. What do we call that part that we look through again? What was that part that you use your eyes to look into? Yeah, so these up here are called the ocular lenses. The ocular lenses where we look into our microscope. Remember that by themselves, they make things 10 times bigger. So when we're thinking about our functions of, of the ocular lenses, so the ocular lens, it's going to make things 10 times bigger, magnify things 10 times. The other thing that's going to magnify things are our little objectives that we see down here. Notice in, in my picture, the picture from your lab packet, they are color coded and we'll see them up close better in my other picture. But all of my objectives, there are three of them. I only see two, but they're three all attached to this revolving nose piece that we see right here. Here is our mechanical stage where our slides sit on top of. We clip those slides in place using the stage clip that we see right here. Notice this little thing that hangs down under the stage called the stage adjustment knob. The stage adjustment knob moves this whole stage left or right and forward and backwards. So that's the stage adjustment knob, knob down here. We also have the coarse adjustment knob that I see right next to the arm of the microscope and that 
fine adjustment knob that sticks out as well. I had some questions about things like the condenser and the iris diaphragm and some of those other things. So let's talk about that. I'm looking up close and personal at my microscope from the front. Before I talk about those, those things that work on the light, let me mention I can see the three objectives right here. This is my shortest little objective, my one that makes things four times bigger. What was the name of the red objective that makes things four times bigger? Yeah, my scanning objective makes things four times bigger. That's the one that has a red stripe on it. It's also the smallest one, the scanning objective. Next door neighbor is the one that magnifies things 10 times. The one thing that magnif the, the one that magnifies things 10 times is called the low power objective, the low power objective. And then we see our blue one over there. That blue one is called the high power objective the high power objective and that one by itself makes things 40 times bigger so this is the big guns when we want to see things really well we got to go all the way up to blue i know i had a couple of friends mention in the chat that you're also taking micro and you've used uh use the same websites we're using here with micro there's actually one other objective lens that you also have for any of my micro friends Care to talk a little about that last one? Yeah, so um, with the, the last one that the anatomy microscopes never have, because we don't need it, but you definitely need it for micro, is what's called the oil immersion lens. And that one is even longer than this high power objective lens. So that one has a white stripe on it. And if you ever use the white stripe lens, 100% of the time, you absolutely must put oil on your slide. That's why it's called the oil immersion lens, because you have to use oil to see things correctly. So we don't have that one on our microscopes, but when you take microbiology, you will be, be using that one as well. So um, oil, the oil immersion lens makes things 100 times bigger, so way more powerful than, than our high power objective here. By the way, let me mention a term that you need to know in, um, in your packet. Let me do a little drawing right here. Here's a circle for you. This circle is representing something called the working distance. The working distance. Definition for what working distance is the space between the objective and the slide. The space between the objective lens and the slide. So from the bottom of this low power objective here down to my microscope slide, this is a space called the working distance. Now the working distance is a good thing for you. Uh, it, it's, it gives you space to move your stage up and down. When we're focusing using the coarse and fine adjustment knobs, we're actually changing the size of the working distance, the space between the lens and the stage. But here's the deal with working distance. Notice how with my yellow objective lens right here, I've got a pretty good amount of space. My working distance is, is decent here. If we were to rotate into place this high power objective lens, the amount of space here in the working distance would go down a lot. And actually, to be fair, this amount of working distance would never fly for this objective lens. It would have to be way closer. The, the stage and the objective would have to be way closer to, uh, for us to be able to actually be in focus. The big idea with working distance, the amount of space between the objective and the slide, the more magnification power you have, so the, the longer my objective lens, basically, the less working distance that we have. And when your working distance goes down, 
it becomes way more dangerous to move your stage. Because if there's like millimeters of working distance and I use that course adjustment knob over here and I move the stage a whole bunch, again, there's a very good chance that I'm gonna break that slide. So working distance, the amount of space between the objective and the stage. As long as there, there's space in there, I can move, but there's way less space uh, when we compare the scanning objective, say, to the low power objective, or the low power objective to the high power objective. So one of our, our important microscope words, working distance. On this picture here, we see labeled two of my structures that change the light in a microscope. So um, the, the first structure that I see right here, the, this whole thing that we're looking at, is called the iris diaphragm. Iris diaphragm. And we already talked about this one a little bit. The iris diaphragm is like the iris in your eye. That's the colored part of your eye. So it gets bigger or smaller to let in different amounts of light. So this part uh, underneath the stage of the microscope is the iris diaphragm that opens and closes to let in different amounts of light. What controls how much light gets in and out is the iris diaphragm lever. So this label over here is the iris diaphragm lever. Simply put, the iris diaphragm lever controls the iris diaphragm. Uh, all it, it helps to open and close the iris. What you can't see really well in this picture that also changes the light on a microscope would be way up here, kind of even more underneath the stage. Way up here, more underneath the stage, there's gonna be a structure in there that's called the condenser. The condenser. We don't ask you to label that. It's, it's too hard to see. But the job of the condenser is to focus the light onto the slide. See, my iris diaphragm uh, determines the amount of light that gets to my slide. Are we putting a lot of light or a little bit of light? Whatever amount of light I'm putting on there, I need to make sure that it's focused in the right place. That's the job of the condenser that lives right under the stage. So the condenser, not something you have to label, but something that you do need to know its job. Its job is to focus the light. The iris diaphragm lever opens and closes the iris diaphragm. That's gonna dictate how much light can get onto the slide. Any other microscope labeling questions? Any thumbs up? Edith says no questions. Okay, Audrey, what were you looking for on the other picture? Audrey mentioned our other one, let's bounce back. Okay, uh, yeah, so she was asking about this one down here. Yeah, this is our light adjustment knob. So in addition to us being able to change the amount of light that comes from the light source onto the slide, we can also change how bright this, this light itself is. So we have two ways actually on our microscopes to adjust the light. Um, one of them is using this light adjustment knob. That's just a, a really crude way of either turning the lights up or turning the lights down. The iris diaphragm does it a little bit more in a little bit more focused of a way. Uh, I, Barbara, unfortunately, I can't make this picture any bigger because it came straight out of the lab packet. So uh, it's the same picture that you have in your lab packet, though. Um, you could consider blowing that up on your computer, maybe making it a little bit bigger. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, um, let's talk about another important microscope idea. And this idea is something called total magnification. Total magnification. 
in our class, most of the time, I will not make you learn numbers. I will not make you do math. The exception to that rule is when we talk about the total magnification of a microscope. So some terminology that we used before, we have what's called a compound microscope. Compound microscopes make things bigger twice. So with our compound microscopes, making things bigger twice, we actually end up having to do a calculation or do a little bit of math to figure out exactly how big what we're looking at is. So the first way that we magnify things that we talked about is our ocular lens. Our ocular lens by itself magnifies things 10 times, makes them 10 times bigger. The second way that we magnify things is using those objectives. But remember, we have more than one different objective that we could use. So when you're thinking about the total magnification of something you're looking at on a slide, we have to consider that we've magnified it twice. The oculars are always going to magnify things 10 times. Always. They, they're always going to work the same in our class. But my objectives will magnify differently depending on, on which lens we have in place. So if we have our scanning objective in place, that's the, the red one, the small one, that makes things four times bigger. If we have our low power objective, that's our yellow one in place, that's going to make things 10 times bigger. If we have our high power objective, the blue one in place, they're magnifying things 40 times. Now is our chance to make our math teachers proud. When we have each of these different objectives in place, we're going to have different total magnifications. So I'm all going to take 10 times my oculars magnification and multiply that by four times. For my scanning objective. When you look at something with the scanning objective in place, what's the total magnification of what you're seeing? How much bigger total compared to normal is that one? Yeah, exactly. When I have the scanning objective in place, my total magnification, I'm seeing things 40 times bigger than real life, 40 times. That's helpful, and with some of our tissues, that might be enough, enough like uh, bone connected tissue, for example. That might be enough. Usually, though, we're going to need more than, than 40 times magnification. Maybe we're going to bump up to our low power objective. For the low power objective, it's 10 times for the ocular, 10 times for the objective. What's my total magnification with the low power objective in place. If the low power is in place, yeah, now we're up to 100 times bigger. Again, that, that's pretty helpful for, for some of my tissues. That's going to work. Most of my tissues, though, we're going to have to go all the way up to the high power objective. The high power objective, we have 10 times for the ocular, 40 times for the objective which means that my total magnification, when I have that high power objective in place, things are getting 400 times bigger than real life. This is why we can start seeing what cells actually look like. When we get them 400 times bigger than real life, that's when we start to see things. Now, there are two ways you can go about learning this information. First way we can learn this total magnification stuff is you can just memorize what the total magnifications are for each of these objective lenses. That's totally fair. There's just three numbers to memorize. If that works for you best, go ahead and do that. The second way would be to memorize this equation. So every time my ocular always has a 10 times magnification, depending on which objective is in place, we're always going to multiply that number by 10. I don't care which way you decide to remember uh, total magnification, whether you just memorize our numbers 
or whether you learn that equation. Either way, be prepared to do this kind of math. This is the only math that we're going to make you do. Be prepared to do this kind of math on the homework assignment and on the midterm exam. Questions about total magnification or thumbs up? What do we think? Awesome. All right. Let's talk about another important concept with our microscopes. Here's what we, we couldn't quite do with our, our microscope online because they didn't have our, um, our three fibers slide. If we were in lab together, we would look at a slide that looked kind of like this, where there's three different threads on top of it, different colors. What I would tell you to do first is to look at those threads, see what order you think they're laying in, see how many of them you can focus on. With our eyes, we can see all three of them. Everything is in focus. When we put that slide on a microscope and we start to use the objectives to, to look at things, you would notice very quickly that we go from seeing all three fibers clearly to maybe only seeing one or two of them clearly. One of them is, is not in focus in the background. And if we go all the way up to the high power objective, you may only be able to see one part of one of those, those threads. This is because of an idea called the depth of field. So the depth of field is how deep into your slide you can see at once. So if I have three layers or three different threads on my slide, I won't be able to see all three of them in focus when I'm zoomed in really close. I may only be able to see one of them or part of, of one of them. So the higher your magnification, the smaller your depth of field, less and less of that slide comes into focus. This is another reason, by the way, why when I have that high power objective in place, I don't want to use my course adjustment knob because if I can only focus on one tiny sliver of that slide and then I move that slide a bunch, I'm going to be focused in the wrong place, like 100% guarantee. So course adjustment knob only used when we have the scanning objective in place. Otherwise, my depth of field is too small and I'm going to be completely out of focus. So depth of field, again, about how deep or, or how much of that slide we can focus on at one time, depth of field. Let's see. Let's jump to another microscopy term. This term is called field of view. When you're looking at something on the microscope, the field of view is, is how much of that slide you can actually see. When we have our scanning objective in place, our field of view, the amount of the slide that we can see is really high. I can, can see a lot of space on it. When we go to that low power objective and we've zoomed in a little bit closer, my field of view gets a lot smaller. So the amount of space on that slide I can see has gone down a bunch. And when you go all the way up to that high power objective, your field of view is very, very small. So the amount of space on that slide you can actually see really small. This is why when you're working with a microscope in person in real life, you always have to make sure that what you're looking for is in the center of that field of view. If this little dot was off to the side over here, what would happen is when I zoomed in, my, my next objective is still going to be focusing on the middle of, of the field of view. It's going straight down and diving in. But if my, my point was way over here, I might miss it. And then over here with my, my super high power, that would be all the way up here. And I definitely wouldn't see it. So when you're playing with slides and one day when we get to go back to the lab together, when you're working on focusing things, the kind of tissue you're looking for, always make sure that what you're looking for, 
the, the type of cell or the part of the slide you want to see before you go from the low power or scanning objective to the low power objective, make sure you put that dot in the middle. And before you go from the low power objective to the high power objective, make sure that dots in the middle. That's the idea of field of view, how much of that slide you can see at one time. The only other microscope concept I have to mention for you is something that we're all familiar with because of our, our uh, the cameras on our phones. <laughs> this is the idea of magnification and resolution. Magnification, simply put, just means we're making something bigger. We can magnify anything. You can find a picture in Google Images and you can stretch it bigger. I do this all the time. I stretch a picture bigger and then I realize, oh, do not have the resolution. Resolution, when you're thinking about it in easy person words, is how clear a picture looks. So notice here with, with my two letter E's here, with my two letter E's that are maybe a, a mock-up of this one here, both of these E's are bigger. Both of them are magnified. I made them both bigger, awesome. But only this one also has high resolution. This one is definitely a bigger letter E, but it's not very clear. I can't see it very clearly. Our goal when we use microscopes is not only to magnify things, to make them bigger, but also to make sure that they have very high resolution. That's why we use the fine adjustment knob to get that resolution, the clarity, the clearness of it to be high as well. Magnification and resolution. That's all I got about microscopes. In the chat, any last minute quandaries about microscopes, how to use them, where to find stuff, or you can send me an emoji. I hope I don't get any of these. Don't send me those Z's, although I'd be right there with you, man. Should we schedule a, a class to be a nap time? And you can tell your family, I'm sorry. My teacher said this is when we sleep. <laughs> I like it. Audrey gave me the scientist. <laughs> 100%. Yep. Hey, so here you all have to hold me to this toward uh, the end of the semester. Last semester with my students, you'll see coming up. Actually, I can't. It might actually be in tomorrow's class. We're going to start talking about a cell like a salty banana. We're going to spend all semester talking about the cell like a salty banana. Um, at the very end of the semester with my students last semester, we did what we called the salty banana challenge, where we all brought a banana to class together, put a little salt on it and took a bite. So it, it wasn't quite scheduling nap time, but we might have to schedule another salty banana challenge for uh, the end of this semester. So help me remember. And that'll make more sense after tomorrow's lesson, the, the salty banana. Let's see. Um, so I've got a question that I'm going to put to the class. Our friend Elizabeth's asking what parfocal means. Could we put that in easy words? What might be a, an easy description of parfocal instead of like the crazy one in the lab packet? If you're trying to teach my four-year-old, what does parfocal mean? Yeah, I like that, Kira. The idea that, that we can change which objective we're using. So we can go from scanning objective to low power to high power. Um, absolutely, it's going to remain in focus or we're not going to lose focus. Basically, if we were in lab doing this, if you get in focus on the scanning objective, you're probably in good shape. You shouldn't have to change it much when you go higher. So it always comes down to red. 
if we can get it in focus with that scanning objective, we should be should be good. And uh, yeah, so Summer asked a question about practicing labeling. Um, so I'm not totally sure what you mean by labeling without help. Um, you will always, the, the format that you see on the homework assignments will be the format of the exams. Um, but it, it's not, it, if you can come up with the name of these microscope parts without a parts list, for example, that means you really know your microscope well. So not a bad idea to consider maybe printing an extra copy of the picture of the microscope see if you can label it without a list of what all those terms are called. Because if you can label it without a list, 100% you know your stuff and you're ready for that exam. Okay, yeah, so Audrey gave another example of, of what we could do for par parfocal. So if we put something somewhere and you move closer and farther, um, yeah, it stays in focus for you, at least hopefully, <laughs> right? Um, as we get older, I, I let's be real, I'm starting to get older. We're going to talk at the end of the semester about what happens to your vision as you get older. <laughs> and it becomes a little bit harder for our eyes to be parfocal. But uh, for, for most of us in class today, probably your eyes are parfocal as well. So the ability to move close and far away and it's still clear. I like that. That's a great example, great real life example of parfocal. All right, so we knocked out microscopes. Let's bounce into the next topic of the week. The next topic of this week, what it was called in technical terms, is cytology. Uh, so cytology is just a fancy word for the study of cells. Cytology, the study of cells. And actually, we're going to be doing a lot of cytology in lecture this week. Um, by the way, a, a teaser for tomorrow in, in lecture lesson number two, which is introduction to the cell. I tell you to go back to this week's lab packet to review the jobs of different organelles. Most of the time, here's just a good clarifying picture in general. Most of the time, the content that we cover in our lab class only relates to lab, but sometimes, very rarely, sometimes that material is also included in lecture. The functions of the parts of a cell, of the things called the organelles, that is something that is included in lecture, just like it's included in lab. So I made you make a note for yourself in your lecture lesson outline that you need to remember what some of the organelles do, your lab packet is a great resource to look back at to see what different organelles do. So both in lecture and in lab, we're doing some cytology. We're doing some studying of cells. There are two different cell models that you're labeling. We have what's called the small cell model and the big cell model. Let's go through and find some of our structures in both of these models and work on labeling them and talking about their functions. So let's start with something that the colors are the same. We like it when colors are the same because that makes it easy. Let's talk about these things that are orange, these orange things here. Does anyone know from their practicing what organelle is shown here in orange? Awesome. Yeah, so several of our friends here are chiming in that my orange organelles are called the mitochondria. So anywhere on both of these, these organelles, or both of these models where I see the orange organelles, these are the mitochondria. Mitochondria, the reason that you can see this weird little pattern that, that's shown inside both of them. Mitochondria have something inside of them that we won't talk too much about this semester, uh, but it's something called the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is inside the mitochondria. More specifically, it's inside all of these little folds that you see in these places here. 
So that's why we can see them. It shows us where we find this thing called the electron transport chain. The goal of the electron transport chain is to do what mitochondria do. The electron transport chain makes ATP. So when you're thinking about the purpose or the function of mitochondria, their job is to make ATP or to make energy. I already kind of hinted at this earlier. I know in, in high school, your teacher taught you that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. They're not wrong, but in college anatomy, we say what specifically that power is. That power is ATP. So mitochondria make ATP. That's my orange organelles that I see all over the place in, in both of my, my models here. The next thing that's labeled in the same color is this pink organelle right here and this pink organelle over here. What is the name of my pink organelles that I see in these cells? And I know that other one doesn't look quite pink. It looks more pink in person. <laughs> yeah, so, so my pink organelles are what we call the Golgi apparatus or the Golgi body. You can, you'll see it labeled either way. Uh, on the homework assignments, it's, it's going to be the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is a part of your cell that helps to sort things and package things. You'll see some analogies of a cell like a city. So they talk a lot about the Golgi apparatus like the post office, just like Kira said. Absolutely. Uh, so this is the place that when proteins are made, we send them to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus puts them in a nice package and then ships them to another part of the cell. Or for some of those proteins, it'll actually ship them outside of the cell. Yeah, Audrey made a comment about the name. Um, the name actually came from the person who discovered it. To be honest, I don't know a lot about Golgi. I just know that uh, he's very excited probably that we still have this organelle named after him. So Golgi apparatus after Dr. Golgi, whoever he was, may he rest in peace. <laughs> when we talk about the Golgi apparatus packaging proteins, the proteins that it's packaging are coming from a couple of different organelles. The first organelle that they're coming from, let me circle it in my picture on the left, See my little conga line over here? And in my image over here on the right, I'm gonna circle some of these little white things. When I talk about these little dots that are our little tiny organelles that make proteins, what's the little tiny ones that make proteins? What are those little tiny ones called? Yeah, the little tiny ones are things called ribosomes, ribosomes. So when we're talking specifically about just the little dots, the little white part here, these are called ribosomes. You can see the ribosomes by themselves easiest right here, uh, floating around inside the soup of the cell. Coming tomorrow, the name of a cell soup, um, it's something called cytosol. So the soupy stuff inside the cell that's floating around, all that soup, cytosol. No, you're good, Kira. We're gonna talk tomorrow about the difference between cytosol and cytoplasm. Um, you can blame your high school chemistry teacher or high school biology teacher for that one because it's often said wrong. So you're good. Cytosol is the name of the soup. When we have the soup and all of the organelles that are inside of it, then we call it that thing called the cytoplasm. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow. But soupy stuff in the cell, sometimes floating around in that soup, these little ribosomes. These ribosomes also attach themselves. So that's mainly what we see here. See this dark blue tube that's lined in all the little white dots? And we can see it even better over here, this purple tube with all the little red dots. These are things called the rough endoplasmic reticulum, rough endoplasmic reticulum, Let's see if I got space, there we go, 
or when you're writing your notes, you can just call it the ER. You're, you're, I'm never going to ask you to spell that. <laughs> Rough endoplasmic reticulum. When I take some of those ribosomes and I put them on the outside of this organelle that's a tube, basically, or these organelles that are tubes here, these are called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Both ribosomes and the rough endoplasmic reticulum make proteins for the cell. So when you're matching up functions, um, look for the keyword, these small organelles, that'd be the ribosomes, or this large organelle um, is what, what we would call the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, yeah, so Audrey asked if we would call these like the free ribosomes. Yeah, you could probably call, call them that because we these ribosomes that we see here, we would call them membrane bound. Um, but for our class, when you're thinking about labeling and what's going to show up on, on quizzes and exams, we're just going to call these ribosomes. And if we're pointing to this organelle in general, we are asking you for the rough endoplasmic reticulum, not for those ribosomes by themselves. Yeah. But good question. These ones are technically free floating. These ones are membrane bound. An organelle that you can see best on this model over here is this thing right here. I'm circling it. I also see it here. I also see it here. All of these look just like my rough endoplasmic reticulum except they have no ribosomes. See the ribosomes here on the outside? I've got those membranes. I've got no ribosomes. Yeah, so as, as a couple of us are chiming in, these are an example of what we call the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Smooth because it has no bumpy ribosomes on it. So the smooth ER, you can see it best on this model. I even have a little bit up here for that matter, matter, some smooth ER up here. If we ask you to label it on this model over here, which I'm not a huge fan of, but if you have to label it, the best place that maybe it's seen, see over here how I've got these areas that are blue, but they don't have white spots on the outside. And this part right here where it's blue and there's no white spots on it, that's as close as we're going to get on, on this model to smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum. To be honest with you, though, if we were in person, I would tell you, really, the only smooth ER you need to know, this over here. That's where I'm going to pin it. And I'm pretty sure that's true of the homework as well. But in case you get a question that asks you, Here's the smooth ER on, on this model as well. A couple other things for us to identify. This big organelle, this entire thing here in the center of this cell, and the entire thing in the center of this cell over here, what do we call that big thing in the very center of the cell? Yeah, absolutely. This big area is the nucleus. So the nucleus is the circle in the middle of the cell. If you see an arrow that's pointing directly at this purple part or directly at this white part, we're asking you for the thing called the nuclear envelope or the nuclear membrane. So this central part of the cell is actually divided from the cell with its own membrane. And that is the nuclear membrane or the nuclear envelope. So if you see a bracket, we're talking about the entire nucleus. If you see an arrow pointing right here, that's the membrane. If you see an arrow pointing right here, that's the membrane. Inside the nucleus, we also have a little tiny thing. We can see it over here too, this little tiny marble. What's that thing in the very center of the nucleus? Yeah, a couple of us have named it for me. It's got kind of a weird name. That little marble in the middle of the nucleus is called the nucleolus, the nucleolus. 
nucleolus. So think of it just as the little nucleus. That's the, the white circle we see over here. That's the, the marble that we see over here. Next week in lab, we're going to talk about how the DNA in your cell lives inside the nucleus. And it actually kind of looks fuzzy, like we see inside this cell over here. So you can see the fuzzy DNA that's chilling out in the nucleus over here. You can kind of see some little blue lines that are the DNA in, in this model as well. One other, yeah, so the technical name, as, as we'll see next week, it's called chromatin. That's absolutely right. The, the I call it the spaghetti noodle mess of the DNA that's here inside the nucleus. That's, that's the chromatin. One other organelle for me to point out to you are these little things right here that kind of look like licorice or my little churros over there. Let me pick a different color so you can see it better. I do love me some food analogies. So we, we got the licorice going on over here. We got the churros going on over here. We are absolutely right in the chat. These are things called the centrioles. Centrioles. And uh, again, this is something that we will talk about next week. The job of centrioles is to help you divide your DNA when you're making new cells. So the centrioles right here and the centrioles over here help you to divide up your DNA when you're trying to go from one cell to two cells, the centrioles. I believe we have labeled everything. Are there any other particular cell questions that we had before we transition to regional terms? In case anyone was wondering, there is not an emoji for a cell. Alas, I just checked. <laughs> um, yeah, Jessica asks a good question. Where would we find the plasma membrane? Can you describe for me in the chat? Where do we find the plasma membrane of a cell? Where is that located? Yeah, Edith and Kira are right. The plasma membrane forms the very outside of the cell. So um, if I were to label that here on my small cell model, I would just point to the very outside. You can see it better on my big cell model in kind of the blue line color there. So the plasma membrane completely wraps around the outside of the cell. It divides the inside from the outside. Uh, let me check what else we got. Um, Laura asked about the location of the lysosomes. Audrey asked about the peroxisomes. We are not going to ask you to label the location of those organelles because it's hard to tell for sure which is which. Um, if I were to make an educated guess on our model here, I would say that this is a peroxisome and this is a lysosome. That being said, if you look at the list of organelles you have to label, you don't have to label those ones. We do need to know what they do. We don't need to label them. So when you think about a lysosome, that's gonna be an organelle that kind of does recycling or breaks down waste. So uh, lysosomes, the recycling crew, break stuff down that we don't need anymore. Peroxisomes, are, get their name because they have hydrogen peroxide inside of them. So peroxisomes are there to keep you safe. Uh, they go through and they're going to eliminate free radicals or, or things that would normally really, they would damage your DNA. They would hurt the cell. Peroxisomes are, are there to take care of the bad stuff. So lysosomes recycle, peroxisomes get rid of toxic things. But again, we don't have to label either of those. We had a question in the chat about the smooth ER, what the smooth ER does. Can anyone help me out with that one? What does the smooth ER does? The rough one makes proteins. Yeah. 
Yeah, the smooth ER, since it has no ribosomes, does not make proteins, but the smooth ER makes lipids for us. It also makes things called steroids, which are a type of hormone that are actually soluble in lipids. They like to be in lipids. So the two things the smooth ER makes, uh, some of those steroid hormones and lipids made in the smooth ER, absolutely. A uh, question about antioxidants and your number of peroxisomes. That's an interesting question. Uh, it would seem to make sense, but I, I don't know for sure on that. So if we ate a lot of antioxidants, that's the kind of stuff that a peroxisome might have inside of it. Um, I'm not sure if, if our cell would build more peroxisomes to store it or if they just try to use them, but it's doing the same kind of thing. So possibly, yeah. Yeah, lipids, so another question, we talked about making lipids, what these the smoothie ER does. Lipids is another name for fats, absolutely. Yep, so making fats. All right, well, for tomorrow's lecture, make sure we're feeling pretty good about what our organelles do. Um, that will come up. We're going to review it just a little bit tomorrow. we got a lot of other more important stuff to talk about tomorrow than what those organelles do. But make sure we've reviewed this stuff so that we're ready for that discussion tomorrow about lesson number two, introduction to the cell. I want to use my last little bit of time here to chat with you about regional terms. So this is way back at the beginning of this packet, regional terms. I am not going to label all of the regions with you because 100%, I promise, you can do this. It might take a little bit of finagling. You might have to think a little bit about it, but I know that you can do this. I want to give you some pointers as we wrap up our, our class together, just so you kind of have an idea of how to be thinking about some of these regional terms. And then we'll probably call it good for, for the day. With many of the regional terms that we're learning this week, the name of that region of the body is going to match really well with the names of the bones that are found in that part of the body. So let's look at together at, at some of the regions where the name of that region matches the bones really well. Let's start here. I'm looking at the kneecap right here. My four-year-old knows the name of the bone that lives in the kneecap. Do we know the name of the bone that lives here in the kneecap? Yeah, several of us are chiming in. The bone that lives in the kneecap is called the patella. So when we're talking about the part of the body right by the patella, this is what we would call the patellar, oh here, patellar region. Caps logs probs. There we go. Patellar region, right by the patella, right by the kneecap. Hey, what's the name of the big bone that I find in the thigh? What bone lives right here? Yeah, the big bone that lives right here is the femur. So this region is called the femoral region. Who remembers the name of the bones that are found in your wrist? The little tiny bones that are found in your wrist. Yeah, those are called the carpal bones, right? Hey, this is the carpal region with the carpal bones. Look at this. We're going through and we're knocking out these regions all with, with these bones that we learned. When we talk about places like the forearm and places like the leg, remember that there were two bones in the leg and in the forearm. So let's start up here with the forearm. When I'm talking about the lateral side of the forearm, I'm talking about the side that's by the thumb. 
which bone lived on the thumb side of the arm? Who lives over by the thumb? Yeah, the radius lives over here by the thumb. So when I'm in the forearm and I'm talking about the lateral side, I'm talking about the thumb side, this is gonna be what we call the radial region, the radial region, because it's by the radius bone. When I'm talking about the medial side, the medial side is the pinky side. Who lives over here on the pinky side? Yeah, the pinky side is where I find that ulna. So the, the medial side of the forearm is gonna be called the ulnar region, named based on the radius and the ulna. Hey, we go down here into your shin. When we talk about the bone that's on the outside of your shin, who lives on the outside, or what we might call the lateral side, the outside of the shin over here? Yeah, that's where the fibula is found. So the fibular region on the outside of the shin, which means that big bone in your shin, that's the one that's found on the medial side. What's the bone on the medial side of, of your shin? Yeah, that's where the tibia lives. So there's my tibial region. These are words that come directly from the name of the bones that I find in these places. And there are several others on here too that are gonna come from the names of the bones. There's another place that we get the, the names of these regional terms from though that I wanna make sure to mention for you. The other place that we get names for, for these regional terms, another corollary, are those cavities that, that we studied last week. So I'm looking right here at, at a picture of the chest cavity area. That's this dark one right here. What was the name of the big cavity in the chest? Which cavity was up here? Yeah, this was the place where I had the thoracic cavity, the thoracic cavity. Absolutely. So the thoracic region is in the same place as the thoracic cavity. And if I come over here to this side, when I'm looking all at this region here, this was my abdominal region, the upper part here, the abdominal region. And when I look down here by my pelvic bones, by os coxae, that's my pelvic region. So another source for these names of, of the regional terms is gonna be those, those body cavities that we talked about. As you're working through and labeling these regions, I promise you most of them are related to something we've already talked about. And if it's not related to something we've already talked about, I think it's something you've maybe heard before um, used in, in normal talk. Let me give you one though that, that I think we probably haven't bumped into before that would be a good one for us to just memorize. I'm going up to the top of the shoulder over here. Oops, yeah, top of the shoulder up here. This is called the acromial region. The acromial region is the top of the shoulder. And this gets its name from a bone marking that we're gonna learn way at the end of the semester. The acromial region is named after the acromion, which is something that sticks out on the scapula. So the acromial region found in the top of the shoulder. I'm just gonna give you that one because that one's a little bit more tricky. Uh, the pelvic region is not the same as the inguinal region to your question. Uh, the pelvic region is kind of more what you might think with the hip bones. Um, the inguinal region is going to be more um, medial thighs. Um, we don't actually make you label the inguinal region, but it, yeah, the, the pelvic region is more external. The inguinal region is going to be more internal.
any other last minute questions before we call it a day? Edith says she's good. Hey, let me, before I forget, let me draw you your penguin. You can shoot me an emoji about what we're doing this afternoon or what we wish we were doing. That cruise ship, right? Although I don't know, right now, cruise ship does, sounds terrifying. I'm going to take a pass on a cruise. But take me to the beach, let me tell you. All right, there's our daily penguin. <laughs> yeah, the mountains. Love it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording. If we have any other questions, please feel free to uh, post them in the chat. I'll stick around for a few minutes. Otherwise, coming up tomorrow is lecture lesson number two. Please at least try to look over a lot of it. There's some important stuff in, in that lesson, especially when it comes to things like hypertonic and hypotonic. Um, I, I want you to try to have a little bit of coverage before we hit it in class tomorrow. So um, try to do a little bit of work on that. I hope to see most of you or all of you uh, back with us tomorrow at one o'clock. So have a great afternoon.